I welcome you uh, to today's webinar. My name is Melanie Tanilian, and I'm the director for the Center of Armenian Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, we return today to the South Caucasus uh, for our second part of our two-part series uh, titled Script Sounds and Songs, Mediating History in the Caucasus and Beyond. And I would like to thank the organizers of this fabulous series, Armin Abkarian, Alex McFarlane, and Michael Pfeiffer, as well as our program specialist, Naira Tumanian, who organizes and runs the background of these webinars. So we started last week um, with a lecture by Professor Harsha Ram from UC Berkeley, who presented us with a contrapuntal reading of text from the 18th century written by Russian, Armenian, and Georgian authors that highlighted the entangled nature of historical events and cultural processes in the region. Dr. Samuel Hotkins um, from Yale University then kindly provided us with commentary and insights, and you can view that event as a recording both on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. As always with our uh, webinars, we welcome your questions and you may use your Q&A button at the very center at the bottom of your screen throughout the discussion um, to submit your questions and I encourage you to do so. Um, but I will actually turn this over now um, to one of our organizers who will briefly introduce today's session, uh, Alex McFarlane. Alex is one of our Manugian postdoctoral fellows at the center and works, in, uh, works uh, on the connection between wonder tales in Armenian and other literatures from the Caucasus. So I'll turn it over to you, Alex, and thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie, for that introduction. And thank you everyone who's joining us today uh, for our second part of this series. Um, I will keep this brief because there's a few of us talking and I'm aware that Zoom fatigue is a concern. So I would just say that our goal today is to talk about the combination and recombination of multiple media and forms of cultural production in the Caucasus and beyond and ways of negotiating the past and the present in this region. And I will be speaking at first, followed by uh, my two fellow organizers and speakers. Firstly, Armin Abkarian, a third year PhD student in the history department, studying the history of knowledge in the kingdom of Cilicia. And then Michael Pfeiffer, a lecturer in Armenian studies in the department of Middle East studies, whose work focuses on cosmopolitan poetics will then be followed by our discussant, Rebecca Gould, Professor of the Islamic World and Comparative Literature at the University of Birmingham, who leads an ERC-funded project, Global Literary Theory, Caucasus Literatures Compared. And then after that, the Q&A session, uh, where we can hopefully have as much of a discussion as the Zoom format allows. And so I will start with my paper, um, where I will share my screen. Let's hope this works. Yes, perfect. Great. Um, so my paper is called Patmutian Versen Pofenzer Kalakin, Initial Research on an Armenian Anthology in Wikidruli Script. Um, and I'm going to be focusing here on talking about a particular manuscript uh, that I briefly saw last year in the Matanadaran in Armenia, uh, the digitized version of this manuscript, that is. Um, and I'm now beginning a research project on where hopefully I will be able to see the manuscript again at some point, but obviously in this uh, interesting period in which we live in the pandemic and the terrible war that's currently happening in the Caucasus, such things are complicated. So I begin just speaking about the manuscript. Uh, let me move these things away. There we go. Um, the manuscript is currently held in the Matanadaran, that is the Mezra of Mashtots Institute of Ancient Manuscripts in Yerevan. Um, important information about it is that it was copied in 1869 by someone called Alexander Melikov, and it's 130 folios long and the size is 20 by 17 centimeters. The most interesting feature of the manuscript, of course, is that it is an Armenian manuscript written in Georgian Mukhajuri script, which is a fairly uncommon manuscript 
uh, thing to have happened. And the images you are seeing at the top bar of the slideshow is sadly not of the manuscript itself, but of my hand copied notes where I have hand copied the Georgian script and then written the Armenian script above it. Uh, so enjoy that. Um, the phenomenon of Makaduli Armenian writing. Uh, let's go to this one. Yes, that will do. Uh, the phenomenon of writing uh, the Armenian language in Georgian script is not, not widely attested, certainly compared to the major phenomenon, mainly beyond the Caucasus of Armeno Turkish, the Armenian scripts used for writing primarily Ottoman Turkish as well as Kip Kipchak Turkish, or compared to Tatruli, the use of Georgian Mukhaljuli script to write Azeri Turkish in the Caucasus. The most famous mixture of script and language is undoubtedly Syed Nova, who we'll hear more about later, who wrote Azeri Turkish poems in Georgian and Armenian scripts, mixed languages, and even used a mixture of Georgian and Armenian scripts in the same lines of one text. Instances of Makaduli Armenian writing are, however, rare and somewhat widely distributed, particularly in location. A religious manuscript of 1317 produced in the Man monastery of Gladsor to the south of Lake Savan contains some Armenian glosses in Georgian script. Four centuries later, in 1717, a manuscript produced in Yezdi, Iran, includes biblical and liturgical texts written in the Armenian language using Georgian script. A particularly interesting sounding manuscript from a private collection seen in the 1940s by an Armenian scholar copied in the first half of the 19th century in or around the city of Gori, contains written in Georgian script, a series of Armenian language liturgical materials, hymns and Ashuk songs, the songs of an oral performer, and added to this some Ashuk songs in Georgian and Azeri Turkish languages as well. These examples are not complete, but they speak to the scarcity of the phenomenon of writing Armenian in Georgian script and its disparate nature. This makes a study of the manuscript under consideration here a valuable contribution towards understanding with Kaduli Armenian, both for instances in the Caucasus and beyond, that would give rise to such a way of writing. These are the goals of my postdoctoral project here in Michigan. And so today I'm introducing my first forays into this research, my first questions, and some Am I back? I hope so. I'm sorry, I think my uh, internet disconnected helpfully, so I will share the screen again. Let's see, does this work? Uh, can everyone see my uh, PowerPoint and hear me again? I will take a lack of response as a positive, hopefully. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, excellent, fantastic, sorry about that. Uh, so the contents of this manuscript uh, contain, uh, yes, follows this anthology, which uh, James Russell refers to as the PPK anthology after its first story, The History of the City of Brass or Padmetian Pukhansa Karaki, and I adopt that nomenclature as well. The manuscript contains the following stories, the history of the city of Brass, the history of King Pavul, the council of Nushirvan, the wisdom of Hika or Ahika, the history of the boy and the girl, which is a questions and answers type text, the life of St. Alexianos, a hagiography, and another, the history of St. Stephanos, and then a final uncertain text, which I'm currently not sure what it is based on the catalog description. Hopefully this will be resolved later in research. This is a diverse set of stories that took disparate paths to reach this anthology and the manuscript. For instance, the history of the city of Brass is a moralizing tale of marvels that, in Arabic, uh, 
was eventually added to the 1001 night cycle. And it was translated from Arabic into Armenian in the 10th century and again in the 13th century and copied in many manuscripts. The wisdom of Ahikar is old biblical apoc apocrypha, first known in Aramaic papyri from Elephantine dating to the 5th century BCE and transmitted across the many centuries into late antique languages, including Armenian. The hagiography of St. Alexianos, found in other Armenian prose and poetic versions, originated in Eastern Christianity. It is well known in Syriac. And it later enjoyed a life in Armeno Turkish, printed several times in Constantinople and Beirut. In manuscripts before the PPK anthology was ever printed, these tales appear in many combinations alongside songs, poetry, and other texts including sometimes the history of Alexander of Macedon, known more famously as the Alexander Romance. One manuscript held in the British Library and from perhaps the 17th century includes an abbreviated version of the Alexander Romance, alongside the history of the city of Brass, the Armenian Balam and Yosifat, and the history of Palul the King, among others. In other manuscripts, the history of the city of Brass appears with the history of the youth Farman, a love story with possible Persian origins, and then Armenian hymns too. A 17th century manuscript includes the history of the city of Brass, as well as a lament on the fall of Constantinople and two texts about Gregory the Illuminator, the saint who converted the Armenian king Tiridates III to Christianity. Held in Istanbul is an 18th century manuscript that contains many of the PPK tales, the history of the girl and the boy, the history of King Palul, wisdom of Hikar, councils of Nushavan, as well as the narrative of Zosimus itself concerned with the edges of the world as a wondrous and moralizing space, and then stories of other holy individuals, and again, a text about Gregory the Illuminator. What we see in the manuscript tradition then is a lack of uniformity. Many of these tales are copied side by side, but in varied configurations with other tales and texts that are similarly wondrous, similarly holy, or a combination of the both, of the two in an association between marvels and moralizing that did not become fixed within a particular tale of context, contents until multiple appearances in print. And this circulation pattern is true of the Caucasus too, of which I provide just two examples. This will, yes, there we go. Um, an Armenian manuscript copied in 1645 in Akhalgor, now Leningor, uh, which was a town at the time with an Armenian population, as well as a residence of the Aristavi of Duke of Kasani, includes only the poetic portions of the history of the city of Brass alongside other poems and texts. An 18th century Georgian manuscript at the begin in the library of Alexandria Khakanashvili at the beginning of the 20th century contained a Georgian translation of the history of the city of Brass alongside the Georgian questions of the girl and boy and the wisdom of Hika. Recognizable companions from my so far deeper investigation of the Armenian manuscript tradition and further investigation of these stories, Georgian, st these stories circulation in the Georgian language will reveal whether this similarity is typical or not. And the contents of the Mukajuli Armenian manuscript shared so closely with the printed PPK anthology and complete with its own written out table of contents page, all makes it probable that the manuscript was copied from one of these anthology printings. And the 1857 Tiflis printing is the strongest contender one reason is geography. While the location of the manuscripts copying is not known, it's reasonable to place it closer to Tiflis than to Constantinople or Calcutta. Made by the press of the Nersitian school in Tiflis, this printing shares the same table of contents as the manuscript and also specifically shares some textual features. A small, though by no means decisive example is the opening of the first tale, which in both texts reads the same and translates to there was an the city of Baghdad, a caliph whose name was Abdul Melik. The only difference between the Armenian script text and the Georgian version, Georgian script version of it, uh, is a different ending on the word city, ending in e rather than uh, n, uh, which is a very minor difference in meaning. Um, and then if you compare this to the slightly later printing from Constantinople made in 1861, the closest one before the manuscript, um, the name of the city is different. It is Babylon instead of Baghdad. Um, and the first word is also different, although the meaning is not the same. Is, the meaning is the same. Um, the rest of the opening page is very close between the two printings compared here, back to this one. Uh, 
Um, but of the extremely brief samples I copied in the Matanadaran last year, a later poetic section in the manuscript corresponds very closely with the 1857 Tiflis printing, while the later 1861 Constantinople printing contains a variant of the poem with many entirely different lines. So the 1857 printing is certainly a closer and more likely model. Manuscript versions of the Armenian history of the city of Brass are also not so far from the manuscript, certainly in the opening line. So a manuscript exemplar is not impossible, but the specific table of contents and their ordering in the Mukherjali Armenian manuscript, combined with its closeness to the 1857 printing's text and its possible geographical proximity, points to that printing as the source of the text in the manuscript. A short bit about the scribe who is listed in the Matanodaran's old catalogue as Alexander Melikov. The Melikov family hailed from the Lori Samkhiti region, the Marchlands of past and present Armenian and Georgian polities, where they were Meliks, dukes or princes, successors in regional power, if not always in direct descendants, of the armeno georgian Makhagadzeli family and before them the Bagratid kingdom of Lori. And this family is listed in the Treaty of July 1783 among the East Georgian princes as the House of Melikshvili and was later recognized by Imperial Russia under the name Melikov. The specific identity of this Alexander Melikov, however, remains unknown, and so too where he copied the manuscript, although for now I am presuming a Caucasus setting quite broadly defined. Now I'll give some nice illustrative pictures of this, um, of a market in Tbilisi, and that's a Tatruli manuscript on the right as a little treat. Um, and Tiflis is the most inviting location, but certainly not the only one. Tatruli manuscripts, like that one on the right, were produced primarily in three locations, Tiflis, Maneuli, and Akhlatsiko. And the Mukhajuli Armenian manuscripts mentioned earlier came from Gladzor, Yedzdi, and a little closer by the city of Gori or its surrounding area, so the geographical scope should not be kept too narrow. Crucially, people moved around the Caucasus and beyond in the 19th century, literate and conversant in multiple languages. One example is found in the Enikolopians, an armeno georgian family working as court officials and interpreters in the Caucasus and Persia in the 17th to 19th centuries. Their name, Enikalop, meaning language box, was conferred by the Georgian kings to Mirza Zorab, born in the 17th century, whose title Mirza denoted his role as, denoted his role as a scribe in Persian society. His and his, de his and his descendants' existence across the lines of present-day national identity was not exceptional. On the streets of Tbilisi, language is mixed. The city of the 19th century was home to a significant Armenian mercantile and trade population, joined by Georgian gentry recruited to the Russian, late, to the Russian imperial state apparatus. These summary categorizations of groups should not be taken as linguistic or otherwise absolute divisions. The Kinto peddlers sang poems that, at their most macaronic, mixed Russian, Georgian, and Armenian lines and words. Armenian craftsmen might write verse in Georgian. So it's important to me to see this Mukhajuli Armenian manuscript as not especially strange, but rather another manifestation of cosmopolitan contacts like that of Tiflis. These settings over the centuries produced prose and poetry at various registers, whether the visual blending of language and script in some of Syed Nova's work, or the 19th century Kinto wielding Russian amid polyglot poems as, to quote Hasharam from last week, an ironic marker of social and political difference, end quote. Where amid these artifacts of the Caucasus' is history to place the Mukhajuli Armenian manuscript? My interest so far in the philological aspects of this manuscript is not only because I find this fun, though I certainly do, but because it opens up a perspective into the manuscript as a practical object, how it came to exist. At this early stage of research, the manuscript itself speaks some certainties. Its copyist, Alexander Melikov, knew the Armenian language and read the Georgian Mukhajuli script. He most likely used the 1857 Tiflis printing as his model. It is in no way a lavish manuscript, and while it's not pocket-sized, it is not too large to easily carry if need be. The alteration in script from the printed PPK anthology to the manuscript suggests an intended reader literate in Georgian, who also, I presume, spoke at least some Armenian, but did not read it. Thus, the use of Mukhajuli to render written Armenian accessible. Models of early, print read, early modern print readership point to wider publics than a single person purchasing a book. This reader of Georgian and speaker of Armenian, perhaps reading aloud stories in Armenian to friends or gathered strangers, 
in the home or in the cafes and marketplaces of cities or towns like Tiflis. Through this communal reading, books and periodicals spread beyond the literate, shared more often than they were bought. I wonder too, to briefly dip back into philology, if the process of voicing this manuscript began with its copying, seen in some features of how the language is specifically written, um, and such as uh, for Ikez, being written as Ikiz with the same vowel in Georgian. Uh, uh, most interesting to me, at least in my initial, oops, sorry, um, initial glance at it was the word Ismez, which would be pronounced with a schwa at the beginning, which might be written sometimes, especially in poetry, to emphasize the, the meter, uh, but written in the print anthology as just Ismez, the Zetma Eze, written in the um, Makhajuli Armenian manuscript as Azmiz with an A at the beginning to emphasize the presence of the schwa. And also the use of the Georgian letter H for both the Armenian letter her and Ye, which uh, is known to have become, especially at the beginning of words, a her sound after initially in a sort of traditional grabarn uh, being a year sound. Uh, so it's following these vocal changes in the language that might not necessarily be written, but were spoken aloud. Um, whether or not this were, reflects someone speaking aloud as they copied the manuscript to sound out these words or simply muttering to themselves, as I have done quietly while copying from manuscripts, um, I couldn't say, but it, see, but it speaks, it's, it speaks the manuscript. Um, thinking about these personal practicalities of this copying process points to the fact that the manuscript is a practical object, arising from the rich linguistic repertoires available in the 19th century Caucasus, a means of sharing stories with people who could not access the printed PPK anthology. They could read it in a familiar script and perhaps read it aloud to gathered companions. At the same time as we do the essential work of looking across the Caucasus and beyond in order to draw connected histories, contrapuntal histories following Hasha Ram's example last week, I consider it important to simultaneously look at micro histories as expressed by Sebu Lanyan, who writes that paying attention to such trifles is essential for, I quote, restoring the role of human agency and subjectivity, end quote, to large scale histories. I think this is the kind of work we're all interested in, if I may presume, and the trifle that I present is this manuscript of Makajuli Armenian wonder tales. Over the course of this research, I look forward to finding the ways in which it's one more piece of a pattern in which the people of the Caucasus and beyond were and are bound together, as well as an object that exists because of personal experiences of reading and sharing these marvelous and moralizing stories. So thank you very much for listening to my paper. Um, and as a reminder, we'll be taking questions at the end of the session after all three of us have spoken. And I now hand the floor over to Armin Karian, who will be taking us into the equally wonderful world of medieval poetry. Okay, let's stop the sharing. Armin, take it over. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Alex, thank you very much for that really exciting and stimulating talk. So uh, let's get started here. Just a sec. And here we go. Okay, so thank you for joining us today. Uh, today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Hovanes Tilkuransi and the poem Verse for the Brave Libarid, which is a poem about the fall of the Cilician Kingdom of Armenia, which took place in the latter half of the 14th century. So before we delve into the poem itself, I think it might be a little bit helpful to go into a little uh, bit of historical background about the uh, poem's narrative. Sorry. And so here on the map is generally the area that we're talking about. Uh, this is the Cilician Kingdom of Armenia, uh, and it was located in uh, southeastern Anatolia in what is modern day Adana in Turkey. And uh, it existed as a relatively or semi-independent kingdom between the 12th to the 14th centuries. So this kingdom was uh, formed uh, 
uh, when the Byzantine emperor started relocating Armenian nobles from its eastern frontiers in, the, uh, in eastern Anatolia to um, modern day Adana and uh, providing fiefdoms for these nobles. So as these nobles settled into the area, their geographic location, in addition to some other factors, led to their intimate involvement in the Crusades, the Latin Crusades to uh, capture uh, the Holy Land. And um, over time, the influence of the Latin Crusaders grew to the point where for the last uh, half century or so of the kingdom's existence, the Crusader uh, dynasty of Lusignan ended up inheriting the uh, kingdom of Cilicia. And this uh, inheritance had a mixed reception, uh, partly because uh, the Lusignan dynasty uh, embarked on an enthusiastic policy of spreading Catholicism uh, within the uh, Armenian kingdom of Cilicia, which traditionally followed the uh, Armenian Apostolic Church. Uh, this had a mixed result because uh, obviously the king was very much for it and some of the uh, nobles were receptive to it because of the promise of further military assistance um, from the Pope to battle uh, Cilicia's longtime enemy, the Mamluk Sultanate. Um, however, other factions in the kingdom, such as the non-elites and the clergy, uh, were not very receptive to this uh, at all. And um, so this is essentially the historical context around which the um, narrative of the poem takes place. This uh, instability within, this factionalization within, and uh, dangers from without, meaning the Mamluk Sultanate. However, there are some issues when uh, dealing with this poem as a source for studying the fall of the kingdom of Cilicia. And um, the two main issues are this, that uh, there is no extant manuscript of this poem from the fall of the kingdom of Cilicia. The earliest extant manuscripts we have of Hovhannes Tukhrantzi, I believe come from around the 16th century. And we start seeing this poem appear in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, on top of that, uh, there isn't a very firm consensus as to who Hovhannes Tugruansi was. So the debate around uh, who, this, uh, who this writer was, uh, particularly in um, older Soviet uh, scholarship, tends to hinge around the source's utility uh, as a means of reinforcing Na historical narrative events by means of this uh, poetic supplement. So, um, uh, so by virtue of that, a lot of the discussion around who Hovhannes Tilgarantzi was stems around this debate of, uh, of making the author a contemporary to the events in question. For example, one very, uh, one very popular theory that's been uh, thrown around by scholars like Emmanuel Pivazian and uh, even referred to by James Russell is that Hovhannes Tilgarantzi was the uh, patriarch, uh, patriarch of Jerusalem under the same name who lived in the 15th century who may have possibly been a contemporary to the events in question. And so while these uh, speculations uh, have a lot of thought behind it and a lot of um, a lot of preparation behind it. The I, the 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 fact that we can't know uh, makes this a very perilous basis from which to begin a historical analysis. So if we can't um, if we can't definitively state that Tugurantzi was a contemporary and and wrote about things that he witnessed, um, I instead referred to um, Hayden White's meta-history as uh, another means of dealing with this text. So meta-history deals with this growing acceptance of history's waning authority as a purveyor of, of objective truth. And White uh, introduces this framework by which um, historians uh, collect and curate events uh, privileging some elements or some events over others or some elements of some events over others in order to weave a coherent narrative, in order to elicit a reaction from the audience, in order to promote a particular ideology. And so it's, uh, it's, this, it's under this framework that I've been um, looking at this poem. So that being said, 
what utility does this poem have if it can't be uh, definitively placed in this time period? So before getting into that, I think it would be helpful to talk a little bit about the narrative of the poem itself so that um, it, 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 to, to ease our discussion of it. So Verse for the Brave Libarid centers around a Cilician Armenian general named Libarid who has a great reputation both in the Cilician kingdom and beyond and is known for reliably and regularly repelling attacks from a group that the author calls the Turks. They don't refer to them as the Mamluks here they, or the Ismailites, they call them the Turks. And, uh, and that this continues for a while until word arrives that a 60,000 strong Turkmen cavalry army is planning to sweep away the kingdom of Cilicia under, and it's under the command of the Emir of Aleppo by, uh, by the name of Manjak. So Libarid uh, confers with the king of Cilicia and the two come up with a plan. And the plan is essentially that Libarid will charge into battle, meet the enemy in the field, while the king essentially holds the bridge into the castle of Cis, which is the capital city, as a means for uh, reinforcement of Libarid's attacks and also to provide uh, a means by which Libarid can retreat back into the castle at will. So Libarid um, uh, expresses that he knows that his time is drawing near. And so he goes and he essentially makes his peace with his family, he says goodbye to his family, he pays his respects to the church and gets ready for battle. So Libari fights bravely in the battle, but uh, at the time when he needs the king's aid, the king reneges on this deal and retreats back into the castle, uh, leading to Libari eventually becoming surrounded by the enemy and killed. Uh, this tragedy is compounded by uh, the vainness of the king's betrayal because the horsemen are able to enter the capital sees anyway and end up sacking it. And that's essentially where the narrative of the poem ends. So looking through the various um, uh, literary associations, biblical associations that the uh, poem makes, here are some strains that um, struck me that I think we could talk about. Uh, so first is Libarid as this paragon um, of, of virtue and as a martyr. So. Um, so let, let me begin by reading this uh, excerpt from the poem. Uh, this, is, this is an excerpt where it characterizes the character of Libri. Um, so in your soul, you are a brave Samson. When you wore your breastplate from all of you, the Turk would crumble to ashes. Oh, great, powerful, brave Libri. So here, we, there are two things that immediately um, struck me, at least. First is this uh, insistence on the martial character of Libarid. So Libarid is brave, uh, Libarid is also a warrior. So this is somebody who um, is engaging in battle a great deal and he's connected to another martial character from the Bible, uh, Samson. And so Samson uh, and Libarid have similar narratives. Uh, Samson is likewise extremely powerful uh, undefeated, um, unbeatable by force of arms. However, he is eventually um, beaten by means of deception when uh, Bathsheba ends up cutting his hair and he ends up losing his power and is sold into slavery as a result. Similarly, Libarid, as this martial paragon, is likewise not defeated by force of arms, but rather by the deception of the king, by the abandonment of the king. So, in addition to this martial nature of Libarid, there are these strong associations with Libarid as a martyr. So as I said earlier, there, uh, Libarid talks about knowing that his time of death is approaching. He talks about going into the cold earth and um, the poem talks about him painting his body with crimson. That this is a, a motif that is, uh, is pretty common in pre-modern Armenian poetry and the figures down here, he is like Saint Sarkis the Brave, like Saint Toros, like Saint Vartan, a greater conqueror than Mushek, than Durtat, the king of the Armenians. So these are some uh, uh, figures in, uh, in, in the Armenian, uh, uh, among the pantheon of Armenian saints that are very sort of par for the course. For example, Saint Sarkis and Saint Vartan are two very martial figures in the uh, list of Armenian saints, and they're both killed this time by the Sasanian Empire because they refused to recant their faith. Um, 
And so there's this image of Libarid as somebody who's dying for the sake of his faith. And this is reinforced by the last line, then Dirtat, the king of the Armenians. Dirtat refers to, uh, in English, Tiridates III, the Arsakid uh, king of Armenia, who ruled in the early fourth century and is responsible for essentially uh, uh, accepting Christianity and converting his kingdom to Christianity. And by this association, we see that perhaps the author is suggesting that um, Libarid is embodying the qualities of a proper Armenian Christian king more so than the actual king of Cilician Armenia. So moving on, uh, this sort of leads into the next strain that I want to talk about. And these are confessional tensions that begin to manifest in the Cilician court. Uh, so a little earlier, I talked about how there were these factions between the apostolic uh, church and the Catholic church. And, um, and that these tensions sort of come to a head in this poem. So um, there are some subtle and not so subtle hints as to the, um, I guess, superiority of the apostolic uh, confession. And uh, here are a couple of excerpts that I'd like to uh, address to sort of draw on this a little bit. So uh, in this first, so give, give you a brief context of where these excerpts come from in the poem. This comes right in the part of the narrative when the king and Libari receive word that the 60,000 strong army is on the way and the king is admonishing Libari for essentially provoking this. And Libari responds with, he gave sugar as his response saying, I simply did these things in exchange for evils done to my city, but it is not suitable to make conversation. My day of death has arrived. So again, we see here this understanding of his impending doom and a voluntary acceptance of it. Uh, but moreover, it shows this in a way he diplomatically ends the conversation by saying we don't have time to talk about this and that he needs to go and prepare for battle. It's not suitable to make conversation. Later, as he goes and he picks up his nimble spear, he puts on his breastplate, he goes and he says goodbye to his family. But then there's this excerpt, two stanzas down from um, the one I just read. He worshiped before the holy throne and bowed his knee on every altar in glorifying the Trinity and praised all of the princes. So here we see that while he doesn't have time to talk to the king, Libari does have time to go and pay his respects to the church. He's prioritizing this uh, tribute to the church. And so he does bow his knee. It's not that he isn't, uh, he's not showing humility, but he's showing humility to uh, the true authority of, uh, of Cilician Armenia, which is the church. And what is really striking is that uh, the poet writes that he gl glorified the Trinity and praised all of the princes, but there's no mention to him praising the king of Cilician Armenia, such that the absence of the king is very noticeable and very felt here. Um, just to continue down this um, line of thinking, uh, some more of these confessional tensions elaborated. Here's another excerpt. Righteous by nature to the poor, you heeded the Vartapes. Your bond were acclaimed in every nation, O oh, great, powerful, brave Libari. So here, it, it, it's, it's perhaps a little more subtle, but it shows Libari's clear alignment with the poor and the clerical class. These are exactly the two factions who were resistant of the Catholic influence in the Cilician court. So it suggests that Libari is firmly in this camp. Simultaneously, further down in the poem, uh, we have this uh, excerpt. He cast the Lashkar into piles, such that rivers of blood flowed from them. Then the king turned to evil. He took his horsemen and turned back. So here we have, uh, uh, so here we have an explicit statement of the king's role as, the, as an antagonist in this poem, that the king literally charatsav, he became evil, he turned to evil. And that this image of the king is uh, contrasted with the uh, uninterrupted martial successes of Libarid. So while Libarid is essentially piling up bodies of the enemy, uh, the king not only is a traitor to Libarid, but he is also a coward in that he retreats back into his castle. So one final thing I'd like to talk about uh, for this uh, project is attempting to read this poem within the uh, context of Persianate literature. So when I talk about Persianate literature, I'm referring to 
the neologism coined by Marshall Hodgson in his uh, seminal work, uh, Venture of Islam, uh, where Persian is uh, described in the middle period to gradually replace Arabic in certain parts of uh, Islamdom as a, a literary language and as a language of correspondence, and that this led to new literary and cultural networks that began to influence writers who uh, engaged in it. And so in terms of where Armenian literature, pre-modern Armenian literature fits in this network is a little bit hazy because uh, on the one hand, we have uh, scholars such as Nina Garsoyan, the late great Nina Garsoyan, who wrote about um, the Armenian language being the written language, being created in a specifically Christian milieu, and that it, it would that it expressed itself in an eternal opposition to the the their heathen neighbors, such as the Sasanians at first and the Zoroastrian influence, and later with the advent of the Arab conquest to Islam. Um, however, we see likewise other um, uh, uh, other interpretations, such as James Russell's uh, discussion of the intimate uh, and frequent engagement of pre-modern Armenian poetry, specifically with this pre-modern Iranian, um, Parthian, Sasanian um, uh, cultural network, and later with the advent of the Arab conquest, this um, this uh, adoption of various aspects of Arabic literature, such as Arabic verse. So uh, we have here in, in this excerpt uh, describing the aftermath of the death of Libarid, in the bakcha and trees that were in the land of seas, all of the blossom with their innumerable colors sighed and wailed at one another. Oh, great, powerful, brave Libarid. So again, we see this juxtaposition of the kingdom of Armenia with the bakcha, the, the garden, a very familiar image and concept in the in, in Persianate literature. Um, however, that it, it is, it's uh, not quite so clear cut as this. Okay. Um, he, in this excerpt, we have uh, the following. 60,000 Turkmen arose. They bellowed loudly and became enraged. They blew the horn for battle. They sounded the bulk and the nafir to arms. So what I wanted to uh, bring to your attention with this um, this excerpt is that for the majority of the poem, with the exception of the Bakche reference, um, the uh, author uses these Arabic and Persian loanwords specifically when uh, characterizing the antagonists, the Turkmen army, the approaching Turkmen army. They're not an army, they're Lashkar. They're not, uh, they're not sounding the Galarapog, they're sounding the Bug. They're not sounding the Yechjerapog, they're sounding Nafir. So, I, uh, as this pro project develops, because it's still clearly very much a work in progress, uh, one of the questions I was thinking about was, is there a way to simultaneously engage with the Persianate and reject it at the same time? And finally, I would just like to say um, further issues that uh, have come up in terms of my, uh, in terms of the development of this project is the uh, secondary literature's uh, reticence to consult manuscript sources. So in, um, in the secondary literature, uh, particularly the Soviet literature and also uh, renowned scholars like uh, James Russell, when referring to this poem, they frequently refer to Revond Alishan's critical edition that he had published in the 19th century in Venice. And, um, and that, uh, that this has uh, essentially colored the uh, interpretations and, the, and uh, past analyses of this poem. So part of what uh, I want to work on for this project is, uh, is analyzing this poem as part of its original manuscript context. Uh, I want to ask, um, for example, what, why was this poem included in a particular anthology? What relevance, be it historic or uh, literary, could it have for the audience that it would be reproduced uh, uh, in the 16th century, in the 17th century? And um, so for this project, I have not been able to procure uh, a manuscript for myself, first due to the pandemic and then due to the war on Artsakh. Uh, but that this is the future steps of this project. So 
thank you very much for your time. And uh, I would be really grateful for any feedback you may have or any sort of advice as to where I could take this project in the future. Thank you very much. And now I believe Michael Piper. Hey, Michael. Hey. Um, hello, everyone. I just want to begin by saying thank you to Alex and Armin, and also to Melanie and Naira, and finally to Rebecca Gould, um, who has graciously agreed to be our respondent today. I'm just going to dive right in um, after I share my screen with you. Okay. Today, I'm going to briefly examine the mediation of history in the case of Sergei Parajanov's celebrated otherworldly film, Naranguina, or The Color of Pomegranates, which was first released in 1969 in Soviet Armenia. Though the film's iconic visual style, with its flat tableau that mimic the miniatures of Persianate manuscript painting, has obviously received the lion's share of scholarly attention and discussions on the film. I want to shed light on something else today. That is, its heterogeneous use of music and sound. So, why sound? Parajanov is often credited with being one of the founding figures and practitioners of poetic cinema, beginning with his classic Ukrainian film, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors from 1965. Generally, in scholarly discourse, what is poetic about this cinema is found partly in the ways its filmic images mirror one another, producing something akin to a visual rhyme scheme, as well as its subordination of plot to affect and semantic ambiguity. Or, as Jean Voronskaya puts it, these films are poetic insofar as they belong less to the realm of narrative than to a cinema of images. Rarely, however, do these discussions on the poetic in Parajanov's films attempt to grapple with the most immediate material with which his films engage. That is, the poetic traditions found in different Caucasian languages, most notably Armenian, Azeri, Turkish, and Georgian, whose poetics do not always symmetrically align with formalist theory on narrative or image. Like many pre-modern poetic traditions, however, the poetry of the Caucasus, in all its heterogeneity, was generally not silent, but rather was often meant to be read, or even sung, aloud. Poetry came alive in a performance, encountering its audience through the medium of a human voice. And so, to think poetically with Parajanov, it seems reasonable to consider the literal and figurative poetics of The Color of Pomegranates performed aloud in dialogue with the image. That is, as I hope to demonstrate through a few simple but prominent examples to you, it is useful to consider the actual literature and literary traditions of composition that this film foregrounds in sound and through sound without needing to privilege the figurative poetics of the image over the historical poetics of poetry. Before I begin, I'd like to add that this project, which is part of a broader undertaking I'm doing with my colleague, um, Marie Baronian, is in its early stages. And so I'm especially looking forward to hearing your thoughts and to thinking about Parajanov with you in the question and answer session. Okay. The Color of Pomegranates was originally and simply titled Syat Nova as it follows the life of the eponymous 18th century poet. For those who may not know, Syat Nova was an Armenian poet who hailed from the cosmopolitan city of Tbilisi. He was attached to the court of the Georgian king, Erekli II, and therefore numbers among the few Armenian poets we know of who were patronized to compose in verse and rhyme. Still, Syat Nova is a product of his time and place in many ways. For one, he was a multilingual poet who composed in Armenian, Azeri, Turkish, and Georgian, in addition to his rare citation of a verse in Persian or Russian. His fluency in multiple cultural and linguistic spheres is further reflected by his chosen vocation as an Ashur, which is the Armenian counterpart to the Turkish and Georgian Ashuk, or lover, 
an analog to the minstrel and troubadour. Ashurs, like many pre-modern poets of the Caucasus and its adjacent regions, drew from a particular repertoire to compose new work. Call it a shared storehouse of themes, styles, tropes, and standards that often cut across linguistic boundaries. As I have argued elsewhere, for these performers and other poets in this region, poetic creativity often hung less upon the modern valorization of originality than it did upon the poet's ability to reveal out of pre-existing source material, suddenly new and different meanings. And as we'll see shortly, this basic principle of pre-modern composition is also an animating force in Parajanov's own work. Parajanov famously did not seek to faithfully reproduce the biography of Sayatnova, but rather to recreate the world of the poet on an effective and sensory level. He explains this choice briefly in the film's opening intertitle, but also more elaborately in a famous speech he made in Minsk before his arrest and imprisonment by the Soviet authorities. Criticizing a colleague who had directed a historical film on the life of Shakespeare, Parajanov flippantly proposed to reshoot the project, illustrating his seemingly unfilmic approach. And I quote, give me all your pictures, all your films, King Lear and Hamlet, and I will create for you a third different film using your material and make a negative and I'll show you what Shakespeare really is, he told his audience. And what would the Parajanovian Shakespeare be like? Purely emotional, he concluded, like an etude, like an exercise, like music. In some ways, Parajanov's elliptical description of his own process mirrors the way in which his own body of work is also described in scholarship. As Marie Baronian has observed, <coughs> excuse me, has observed, Parajanov creates not ex nihilo, but rather by weaving and reweaving together pre-existing images and tableau to create new and subtly different meanings out of them. What's striking at least about this example is that Parajanov describes his hypothetical reinvention of Shakespeare through the analogy of music. He does not subordinate the audio to the visual, as Rick Altman might say. Parajanov, of course, was not the only or even the most important person in charge of the film's music and sound design. This position would belong to the brilliant composer Tigran Mansurian, who in numerous interviews states that he wanted to sonically mirror the principles of collage and recombination that Parajanov explores on screen. Like Parajanov, Mansurian also resists any attempt to label his work using familiar categories of analysis. Instead, he insists on being at the crossroads of the music cultures of the East and West in terms of his approach to musical composition and sound engineering. Hence, whereas film scholar Carla Oler has productively analyzed the gradual transformation of wet sounds in the movie to dry sounds, which, she argues, mirrors the process of transmitting Syat Nova's raw affect to future generations through manuscript culture, my focus here will be on sound's mediation of poetic signification. Therefore, in my remaining time, I want to draw attention to a few basic ways that the film sonically engages with, and in fact rewrites and reimagines, the sounds and songs of Syat Nova to create new meanings out of them. The first scene I want to examine comes at about the 19 minute mark of the Criterion Collection remastered release. Syat Nova, played by the Georgian actress Sofiko Chiarelli, is at the Georgian court. He stares directly into the eyes of his audience, as does his beloved, also played by the same actress as seen here. Not coincidentally, frames and framed images abound in this scene, adorning the flat walls and interstices behind and between our characters. There is something recursively filmic about this framing. Obviously, the medium of cinema is similarly bounded 
limited to the size and shape of the screen upon which the image is projected. And yet, as sound theorist Michel Chion has observed, sounds are not bounded as are images in cinema. Unlike the image, there is no analogous container that holds sounds. So while we see Syat Nova holding his kamancha, a bowed musical instrument, the sound of the kamancha emanates from somewhere beyond. Not merely off screen, however, because the image of Syat Nova isn't actually playing the kamancha. The sound in a dreamlike way is simply there, both diegetic and non-diegetic at the same time. Other ambiguously diegetic sounds fade in and out of our hearing. The pouring of grains, the ringing of bells, the blowing of the wind, and for the briefest moment, the laughter of children. We then watch as Syat Nova lifts two bowls and begins to pour the contents of one into the contents of the other, which immediately begins to overflow. Syat Nova never breaks eye contact with his beloved slash the viewer, us, who exists in invisibly on the other side of the bounded image frame. Gradually, in the background, a warbly voice then begins to recite a fragment of Syat Nova's poetry. This half line, Gans me jaren shadatsile, is notoriously difficult to translate. Following Charles Dowsett's interpretation, it likely means something like has increased more than a river or has increased more than a torrent. The preceding half of this sentence, which is absent here, comes from the famous poem, Ashkaras me panjarae, potentially meaning both the world is a window and the world is a cage, depending on how one translates it. Parajanov, with his heavy visual emphasis on the frames within the frame of his film, clearly has the first meaning in mind. The entire line, united, then is this. Syat Nova declared, my pain has increased more than a river. Yet, Mansourian does not simply cite this line and move on. Instead, the warbly voice repeats the line over and again, focusing in particular on the final word, shabatsile. It has increased as we gaze upon the overflowing bowl of what I think is grain, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I'm going to play for you a short clip. Um, this is my only special effect, so I hope it works. The grain here is an appropriate choice. The scene is like a semantic seed planted now before Syat Nova's eventual expulsion from the court, when his pain really will become greater than the torrent of a river, and this famous poem is sung at greater length. Yet here, even in this early scene, our ears catch a practice of poetic citation and gloss, the incorporation of a half line of poetry into the body of the film equivalent, I think, to the Persian poetic practice of Tazmin, or the incorporation of one line from a pre-existing poem into the body of a new poem, which allowed a poet to charge their quoted verse with new meaning. Somewhat analogously, here the film responds in a highly surgical manner to a single aspect of Syat Nova's poem. It does not simply quote this line and move on, but instead performatively emphasizes or overemphasizes a sense of overflowing, of moving beyond, as the English subtitles very loosely put it. 
through the line sonic reduplication. It is as though the semantic or effective content of the line through sonic effusion was itself overflowing the container of the words. Moreover, this practice of selective incorporation is especially important to the message of the film itself, as we'll see in a moment, as it reflects how both Parajanov and Mansurian engage with Syed Nova's body of verse as a whole. Oops. Let's look at the same poem, now quoted or performed at length near the end of the film. This scene takes place primarily in a graveyard, as a large number of sons and daughters process with the body of their mother, whom they are about to inter in the earth. While Syed Nova sings, two angels hold the literal frame of a window up to the audience. Syed Nova stands at the center of the window frame. However, his lips do not move in this scene. His voice comes from somewhere beyond the image. At the emotional climax of the song, the non-diegetic voice sings, quote, Syed Nova declared that my pain has increased more than a river, end quote. Syed Nova then takes the frames out of the angel's hands and begins to move toward the camera. That is, toward the frame of the filmic image. Once again, as the mother's body is lowered to the ground, we hear the same warbly repetition of Shadat Sile. Finally, the mourners look directly into the camera and repeat in one voice, Ashkaris me panjara'e, the world is a window in one of the film's rare instances of synchronized speech, as James Stephan has observed. There are obviously many ways to read this iconic scene. In the context of the poem alone, without augmentation by the image, the world is simply a window. It is the material plane we are trapped in. Thus, Syed Nova is attempting to gaze beyond this veil of tears, but his vision will not go that far. At the same time, when we place these words in dialogue with the image, we can say that the world is also a frame. The world is, within the world of the film, the boundaries or the container of the film itself. Hence, the people who populate that world are constantly striving to look beyond its limits. Quite literally, again, to see past many frames and look upon the audience, us, as though through a one-way mirror. But they too cannot gaze beyond the horizon of the world, which is the cinematic image. Finally, and most importantly, in the, film, in the context of the film's own praxis of citing Syed Nova's poetry, remixing it, adapting it, and incorporating its sound into the medium of cinema, we find a reversal in meaning from the original poem. The sound of Syat Nova is not bounded. It has escaped the frame. It overflows its container, and in fact, it was never framed to begin with. Of course, at least to my mind, one of Parajanov's more subtle points about this film um, is evoked here, and that is that his beloved is also, in a way, art. Art transcends the life of a poet. And here we find Mansurian and Parajanov collaborating to make this point in a literal and performative manner. Syed Nova's voice, the sound of the film, is transcendent, existing outside of the frame. And yet, at the same time, this voice also paradoxically seems to come from the frame, emerging from a particular time and place, and thus locatable in history, as the synchronized speech of the mourners would seem to suggest at the film's end. Like the human voice, which originates in the body, but does not remain there, Parajanov Syat Nova is both historical and transcendent. He is pure feeling and etude. Obviously, there is a lot more that we can say about the heterogeneity of the film's use of sound, and I hope that some of that will come up during the question and answer session. But for now, I would simply like to insist on rereading this film audiovisually to use Xi'an's term, by which I mean experiencing the film's sounds and images as working together to produce a cinematic poetics 
poetics of commentary and reinterpretation. And moreover, a cinematic poetics that makes the historical poetics of the Caucasus present on the screen and in the ear, even while subtly altering its potential for signification. Analogously, by reading the poetics of the film within their historical context, in which originality is revealed through creative forms of poetic citation, pastiche, and recombination, we can perhaps begin to recalibrate what a poetic cinema means in relation to the practices of literary composition in the Caucasus. The film is a part of that tradition of poetic composition, even though it too is not bounded by it. Okay, um, thanks very much for listening. Uh, I'd now like to turn it over to Professor Rebecca Gould, um, who is Professor of the Islamic World and Comparative Literature at the University of Birmingham. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca, for sure. graciously agreeing to um, riff on these papers and challenge them. Um, turn it over sure. to you. Sure. Great. Um, so I see there are two questions, but then I thought I might we might begin with kind of questions from me that I hopefully are addressed to all of the the papers. Um, so one thing that then thanks also to everyone for really stimulating papers. Um, and I should just mention by way of background that um, I work on Georgian and Persian literature. I don't know Armenian, um, I, you know, but I come across sort of aspects of Armenian in my work in various ways. So I've learned a lot. Um, but one thing that um, that struck me about all of the three papers that I was thinking about while listening in different ways was uh, the question of translation and in a sense of rethinking um, translation. Um, one thing I think, you know, anyone who works on, well, perhaps in pre-modern literatures in general, but certainly literatures of the Persianate world is that sort of sometimes the boundary between translation and rewriting, it seems to vary quite a bit. And, and it's, 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 you know, it just doesn't match our modern conceptions um, of it. And so I think in each of, the, each of di different ways, um, each of the papers speaks to different ways of thinking about translation. Um, so specifically with, um, with Alex's um, on the question of this um, Armenian manuscript, um, it made me think, I was thinking of a lot of parallels in Georgian literature of, you know, um, I, they are called translations of Persian texts, but then rat, there are radical rewritings of it. Uh, for example, the Vistramiani, a, a Georgian uh, version of the uh, Persian romance. And I, so I was just wondering, wanting to hear more about um, the relation, if you've looked at the Arabic uh, City of Brass, uh, Thousand and One Nights, if, you know, what kind of relationship there is between source and original um if you could yeah just speak to that i mean do you see it because i think you, you use the word translation which is probably entirely legitimate but you know is there room to think about it as rewriting what how does it work in that context um and i guess also there's yeah so then and, and also another another sort of angle on translation also is to think about multilingualism and how to contain multiple languages within a, a single text and and so it, you know your your manuscript does that in kind of specific ways with the script um for um Armen's really interesting presentation. Um, I was thinking a lot because you talked about the sort of how to think about the Persianate and those very stimulating thoughts in the context of this Armenian text. And I like the idea of this kind of oppositional Persianate or Persian as something to resist as well as to incorporate. Uh, but one thing I was thinking, and again, this comes from my engagement with Georgian, where I also see, you know, there's lots of lexical, you can always pick out the words that are used and lots of Persian tropes. But it, for me, it's really interesting to look at the metrics. And you didn't, so I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, I mean, the actual poem, you know, what is the meter? What is the, the form? Um, I think like, like Armenian and Georgian, both ha have a literature that predates Persian. So there's this long metrical tradition um, that doesn't necessarily, you know, need Persian in order to have a literary form. But I know, so I, I don't know in the case of, of Armenian, but I do know in the case of Georgian, it's very interesting that in the 12th century, the, the major epic is, is written in a meter that is called Shaidi. And so the word for poetry is actually the name of the meter. And even though it's, it's a completely Georgian meter, um, so that's, that's where you find Persianate there. You find it in the actual literary form of the text. And so if you could speak to that, um, that would be fascinating. And um, then, uh, uh, yes, for, for Michael's, um, pa uh, paper and the question of translation. So you approach it for, obviously from a very different angle of multimedia, um, uh, you know, what, what happens, does, does, does shifting mediums um, broaden what can be done with translation? Does it also change our way of thinking about translation? And I guess you could also, I mean, I 
thought the use of the Tasmin um, idea was very interesting there. So in a sense, you know, language is still present and even linguistic translation is still there, but it's more than that too. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I was thinking we could um, maybe speak to that and then go to the other questions. There are at least three, I think, that are here. Does that, does that make sense or? Sure, great. Sounds great. Yeah, I, I love thinking about translation like this. So thank you for these questions. Um, my sort of immediate answer to the direct question about the, the city of brass is um, research pending on that one. The, the Armenian city okay. of brass text exists in multiple uh, versions mm -hmm. and I'm still exploring those different versions. I've made a sort of personal translation of actually the 1911 Tbilisi printed version um, simply so I know what's happening in the text because before that I had read the English translation of the Arabic's uh, 1001 Nights version, which I gather is quite a late Arabic version, um, I would need to acquire Arabic to delve into the Arabic tradition in depth. And that would be a wonderful thing to do in the future. Closer to time, what I would love to do if I could access manuscripts at any point in the coming year or two, um, would be to look into relationships perhaps between the Armenian city of brass versions and in themselves, but also then to look at the Georgian version or versions and. Mm -hmm. those differences and again to see as you say are, are they closer to translations as we understand them or to what extent are they altering text um uh because from what i can see from the armenian one that there, there definitely are differences between the armenian translate one i've looked at and what i assume to be the later arabic version uh, some bits of the text are, are shorter, for instance, and little bits of details change. The sort of overall arching story very much remains the same, and the moral right. of the story remains the same. Um, but yeah, I would love to delve into the, the nitty gritty of, of how things are different between these versions, either versions within the language or versions crossing languages. Um, I believe at least, I don't know how many Georgian translations were made. I think the idea is that at least one of them was made from Armenian. So again, it would be interesting. Hmm. From my current linguistic background, that would be the most productive comparison that I could look at and would definitely love to look at that um, this year or in a future year as access to resources permits. Great. Uh, so thank you, uh, Professor Gould, for uh, that wonderful suggestion. Uh, definitely uh, engagement with the Persian age does, is not limited to loan words or, uh, or, or these sorts of uh, metaphors. Um, to, be, to be perfectly frank, I had not looked into the form or the metrics of, uh, of the poem, uh, either as a means of engagement uh, with the Persian or otherwise, but um, definitely I will be considering this for the future. Um, Great. Up until now I just focused on sort of the imagery, the loan words and stuff, mm -hmm. but Definitely, uh, particularly since Armenian poetry has uh, engaged so much with like Arabic poetry in their verse that it is definitely something that is worth looking into. Thank you very much for this. I, I could just add one one sort of technical point as well, because I, I don't read Armenian, but I was looking at the script and um, I noticed that the, there was a lot of um, the rhyme, right? It was, I mean, the, the mm -hmm. pattern was a, a something like AAA. A, a. Anyway, that's, and that really reminds me a lot of Georgian. So I don't know, you might mm -hmm. want to look into that. Great, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, if I may speak briefly on um, Armenian poetry, which um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I, I wrote my PhD on um, Armenian poetry associated with the Alexander Romance and was taught by Professor Teo van Lint, who cares very much about issues of meter and rhyme. Uh, there is a lot of mono rhyme in Armenian poetry, mm -hmm. uh, either on the half line or on the full line, depending on the particular meter. And something you said about um, Georgian, a Georgian poetic form that takes the word for poetry from another language. One right. of the me metrical forms in Armenian, the kafa, takes the name from kafia, from mm -hmm. Arabic. Wow. Um, hmm. So that interesting. So that there's yeah, definitely some right. interesting comparisons um, going on there for sure. Great. Um, I'll just also say thank you so much for the great comments. Um, yeah, really interesting question about translation across different media forms, and I think kind of riffing on what Alex and Armin were saying, um, there is a tradition in Armenian of a kind of sonic translation or, or partial translation in which the sound of something is borrowed across languages, um, like in the, the kafas that Alex was talking about, or um, the Armenian adoption of Arabic monorhyme in the 11th century. 
Um, and then later on too, figures like, um, as von Lind has um, argued, Konstantin Jerzengatsi, uh, you know, mimicking the Mutakarib meter hmm. uh, by placing unusual stresses um, on the words. <laughs> Armenian poetry is syllabic, so it shouldn't be able to do that kind of long and short um, vowels that a quantitative meter would have, but it can create a, an approximation of it that sort of creates an aural space between the two. Um, mm -hmm. In the context of um, Parajanov, I think, you know, I, wasn't, I hadn't really thought about it before in this way, but um, what gets translated likewise is not just semantic context, um, but, or con but rather a kind of performance context in which semantic content <laughs> generates meaning or does something to its audience. So if we sort of think about like translation as a translation of an, e an epoch in a way in which this performance makes sense um, or translation of, a, of an encounter between an audience and a performer um, and recreating that through the medium of film in a very different way, but also very consciously drawing attention to that process. Um, so sort of, I think like your question was getting at, um, right. it, um, you know, it performatively realizes the thematics of the, of the film. Um, so yeah, I haven't thought too much about it, but, um, sure. but definitely the t that's an interesting way of sort of thinking, you know, translation doing something that's not just about words. Um, right. Great. So I, th I think we could move to the, the questions. Um, there are two in the Q&A and then one, I, I'd see the other one else as well. Um, so and, and the R Ronald Suni's question, um, which is addressed to um, our men, but maybe I, I'll add something that maybe can, maybe can broaden it as well. Um, so he asks, um, flesh out what patriotism, not nationalism might mean in this poem. Patriot to who? Not the king, but to the church, the homeland, the realm. And maybe just an addendum that perhaps might also allow uh, Michael and Alex to speak. Um, I, I, one thing that occurs to me, this, I think it's a sort of riff on that question. Um, each of these works that you're focusing on are kind of, can be seen in, in the sense as exercises in community, building a kind of community, but uh, very different ones. Um, so I just wondered if you could, all of you, a, after our men answers, maybe you could think about what, what community is being envisioned um, in terms of audiences uh, by your works. All right, so uh, thank you, Professor Suni, um, for that question. It's very reminiscent of our uh, semester together last year as, uh, as uh, your TA for your nationalism course. Uh, first of all, let me just address, I'm sorry that I misspoke during my presentation. Um, uh, the great Nina <laughs> Grossman has not, I don't know why I misspoke. I'm very sorry about that. Um, however, when talking about uh, patriotism and not nationalism, um, it's, it, it gets to be a little bit, uh, it gets to be a little difficult because it's this, it's this simultaneous understanding of Cis, the capital, as belonging to Livarit. So it suggests the, the ancient Greek version of patriotism that uh, you suggested, Professor, about this connection to the land. However, there's also these genealogies that are drawn to old Armenia, greater Armenia. So like the King Durtat, he's, he's in the Caucasus. So uh, in this instance, I would say that uh, I, I definitely still need to do a lot more digging on that, uh, but it's definitely not to the king, uh, maybe not to the land, but maybe the community, the, particularly the religious community that is being referred to here as the uh, community to which Libard is being patriotic. So yeah, any, any thoughts on on sort of? I mean, I was thinking, you know, because obviously, if, if if there's a role for patriotism in a text, then then that that's that's there's an audience is presumed there. That's you know the, clearly what what is the text about? So I was just well, yeah, is is it similar or different dynamics in in your two works? I I would say for mine, I sort of had two two responses to that, um, which I, I imagine would operate together. And one of them, the first response is the very personal feeling that I, I get from, a man, from this manuscript, which is probably this represents, as I said, um, an attempt to kind of make these stories accessible to, to more people. But when we say more people, probably a very small yeah. group of people, you know, not, a, not an enormous community, but perhaps an individual and the people who might gather with them, their, their friends, family, companions, etc. Um, so in that sense, it's that 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 community that that 
we all currently miss being able to sit down in a room together and talk about interesting things. Um, but at the same time, the stories themselves do more than that. And the stories are, are, are fun stories, especially the City of Brass story, which is about going on an adventure to the edges of the world. But it's also about morals. And, it, and once they are in Armenian, they're Christian morals. They've kind of been obviously ad adapted in that respect. Um, so that's you know, part of the translation process, of course. Um, they're, they're morals of thinking about how you live, how you live your life, um, the sort of holy exemplars that you can take with the hagiographies that appear in the anthology. These are obviously sort of the pinnacle of holy achievement. And the lessons you might take from the city of brass about the sort of main moral is don't accumulate too much stuff because when you die, that doesn't mean anything. Um, it's how you live your life that's important. And at the end of the story, the, the hero becomes a sort of ascetic living in a cave until he eventually passes. And so the story's sort of wider function in their diffusion over the many centuries is, is this reiteration of these values that are perhaps to be shared by a community caring about certain ways of living morally or, or ways we might think about living morally, even if most of us are not going to become ascetics living in caves, obviously, while also sharing them personally around a table, you know, coffee or alcohol or water or whatever people were sharing with their stories at that time. So it's these these two registers happening at once, I think, that, that comes to mind when I think about community in this text. Great. Um, I, that's a really good question and a tricky one to answer. And I can't <laughs> speak so much to the, um, you know, what happens after the film is made. Um, but I can say that um, Padarjanov is sort of less a human being than just like an event <laughs> wherever he goes. <laughs> and wherever uh -huh. he is, he sort of creates um, first, an immediate, he collects people who are around him or drawn. He's like a charismatic, you know, <laughs> Sufi or something. They just, they're attracted to him and they come into his circle and he gives them things. He's famous for giving people props from his films that don't belong to him. You know, he's got like <laughs> access to the sacred relics of Echmiadzin and he's just handing stuff out to people and the producers have to run back, wow. grab those things from the people in the parking lot and like bring them back into the museum. And, uh, he, he's a person who's like through like manic energy and creativity ends up transforming all of Yerevan um, in as Mansurian sort of describes in an interview into Parajanov land. Everyone's talking about him and thinking about him, thinking about how is he reading Syat Nova and what's he doing? Right. Why is he wandering around with this stuff? And did you get that thing? Did you go to his house party last night? And what did he say? And he talked for four hours there and on and on and on. So th there's something about Again, maybe just riffing on what I was saying, uh, there's, the process is as important as the, the product. And by that, I mean, the, maybe bring back the performance context part of it, is reimagining mm -hmm. um, what a community could look like gathered around the figure of the charismatic preacher poet or something, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, recreated in secular Parajanavian sort of terms. Um, and that's the closest I think I could I could answer now, but I'll have to think about it. Right, great. Okay, so the, going to um, Catherine Babayan's question, which is addressed to our Armin, but also maybe opens up some broad issues. I'll just read that. Um, thank you all for your wonderful contributions. I have a question for Armin. Uh, what does it mean for Liberate to protect the evils inflicted on my city in protecting the poor or clerical establishment um, versus the coward king? Beyond the Persian atrope of unjust kings betraying their subjects, how does Tukranchi weave the Persianate to create a particular subjective position for Liberate's audience in the 16th century? And if I just just to kind of distill something that I think my others could also speak to, perhaps um, at least maybe in the case of Michael, especially um, the I think there's a question here about sort of the the, the relationship between the poet and the state. And the, um, you know, is, is there a critique? Is there an isolated vision? Perhaps, you know, maybe I sense there might be a, a very different um, uh, responses. I mean, maybe there's kind of opposition, contrast to be drawn here between um, Armin's text and Michael's film. But anyway, I'd be interested to hear what be, people, people have to say. And perhaps, I just don't know, I mean, the, the, the kind of the state, the role of justice, or the role of justice certainly is there, but perhaps Alex could also speak to, you know, presence versus absence of that theme. So, so begin with Armin. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Balan, for that uh, wonderful question. So in terms of the uh, subjective position of uh, the audience in the 16th, 17th centuries, 
uh, this is where my own uh, historical background gets a little bit foggy, but I do know that towards the 19th century with the birth of the Armenian national movement, you start seeing a lot of uh, literature by authors like uh, Rafi, who really uh, criticize um, Armenian instruments of the imperial machine, be it the Ottomans or the Hajars, who, are, uh, who essentially administer the Armenian community on the Sultan or on the uh, Shah's behalf. So uh, not having the manuscript in hand, not uh, being able to find the, the benefactor for the manuscript I'm working with, immediately this is where my eye is drawn in terms of um, the formation of Libarid. So while Libarid isn't the king, he is in effect protecting his city. So I think perhaps what, uh, what this uh, poem is maybe serving in terms of speaking to an audience is to encourage this uh, paternalistic attitude of these uh, Armenian meliks, these imperial instruments to um, actually work in the interests of their community. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have too much to add, but um, I, there's a there's a quote from Parajanov's wife, ex-wife, um, that I think about a lot. Where she basically says, Parajanov was a man who afforded himself the luxury of being a free man in an unfree land. Um, mm -hmm. and he almost, like his subversiveness just cannot be contained and there's a sort of beautiful moment in um, the late 60s when he makes the color of pomegranates when everything aligns for him <laughs> exactly in the right way and um, you know the Armenian state is extremely excited to give him access to all this material and to have this um, you know the great Armenian poet um, retold in, in this sort of format that's going to be seen all over the Soviet Union and the world um, and so he's in a position of power for like this fleeting moment in time in terms of at least access to material. Um, and then of course mm. the film comes out and people see it. And this is not the story of um, universal Soviet proto brotherhood. Um, it's a different kind of, um, you know, compact between the peoples of the Caucasus. Um, not one that whose values Parvdanov is trying to recuperate exactly, but one in which he's, a, holds up as a mirror kind of to the present um, that we can look into and maybe imagine an alternate possibility. And of course that possibility is scary um, to the state. And then after he makes this speech, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's, he's arrested and then um, on charges of homosexuality mm -hmm. um, and imprisoned and he makes art from prison, but it really, um, it really scars him. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, one of the yeah. Things, uh -huh. sorry. One of one of the things I'm really interested to to look into over the coming year or, or more probably um, is is kind of the place of this text by the time we get to the mid 19th century, where we're fortunate enough as someone who's come from kind of medieval and earlier initially, um, we start to have so much material that survives from this time, and I'm very curious to learn the place of this text amid that. Um, what else was being produced at this time, in, especially in Tbilisi, where so much was being produced in print, um, and other places in the Caucasus too, if I ever get a, a clearer idea of where this manuscript might have been copied. Um, because I, when I sort of initial reading, you know, by the time we get into the early 20th century, we get what we would now recognise as, you know, very politically radical texts being produced. At the same time as in 1911, we get another reprinting of this anthology of, of now very old stories. And I, I find it very sort of exciting that there's so many different kinds of texts being made at the same time. And I'm interested what that, how, how that might have been received if it's possible to trace that through sort of reviews or adverts and so on in periodicals or anything like that um, to, to get a, a feel of its place amid people's concerns for things like radical or, or non-radical or sort of other political stances of which there are many at the time. Um, so this, this is something I kind of have open in my mind as something to pursue in, in the coming research project. Great. Um, so uh, <clears throat> there's one more question. Are, are we supposed to end now or, or, or continue? You can ask one more and then- Okay, yeah, so, sorry. Who, 
Uh, people all people messaging. are free to do as they wish. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so yes, so so there is one more question I think that speaks to what a lot of you were just saying. Um, it's about absences. And so uh, I'll quickly read that starting with Armin, but I really think all of you, um, it, 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 the, the, you've already sort of spoken to that in different ways and perhaps could expand on it. Um, so I love our Armin's close reading of absences, nicely done. Can you all speak on the theme of absences? How or are you reading for absences? And I would think censorship, perhaps for the modern text, could also be relevant to that. I think, oh, Alex, please. I mean, my my first response to that um, was sort of the opposite of in inclusion, because when um, when Armin said at the end of his paper about wondering why, what well, wanting to pursue why uh, the, the the literate poem gets included in certain manuscripts over the centuries, what what causes it to be included in them, um, and what might it be included alongside, and by whom, you know, what patron or what readers are we looking at? To me, was was a sort of interesting point. Is that's sort of what uh, I've been trying to follow between where these different texts appear in different manuscripts, and in my case. Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested by the absences question too, without necessarily knowing what to say, but when I'm thinking about why are things included? Um, so yes, definitely need to think about why things are not included as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in, in, my, uh, in my own uh, poem, I kind of touched on this a little bit, but the character of the king is really sort of shrouded in mystery and there's almost this um, there's almost this uh, intention to keep it that way. So in most of the uh, in, in most of the sources I've read about the later periods of Cilicia, Liberi doesn't come up unless you know scholars are just citing this poem as like his uh, for his existence. However, uh, we do see Liberi come up in more um, I guess more intimate sources like colophones of Armenian manuscripts. There are some. <laughs> In, from the late uh, 1300s that mention him, that mention his uh, descent. So we have a couple of instances of this character being uh, reinforced, the existence of this character being reinforced, but it doesn't really appear, he, he's not really a, 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 a main player in sort of the traditional narrative. However, the sort of obscuring of the identity of the king has, in a weird way, obscured everyone's perceptions of this king. Like, for example, Revond Alishan, that 19th century Mechitarist monk from Venice who put out the first sort of critical edition, he identified the king as uh, Leo V, who was the last king of, our, uh, of Cilician Armenia. In another article, James Russell calls the king Constantine III. And so it seems like, depending on different scholars, there isn't a sort of consensus in the king's, in, in the king's identity, the king in question. And I think that that's perhaps the uh, intention of the author, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm just right. reading, it, but that to purposely obscure the king in favor of the real uh, defender of, you know, whatever Armenia is at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay, so about absences. Um, well, the most immediate thing that springs to mind is a lot of this um, sort of poetry about the beloved is, of course, um, based right. on this um, degree of you know, you can, you're walking a fine line and it's ambiguous to a lot of people whether Syed Nova's beloved is the king's um, sister or his son. Um, hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a really fine line for Syed Nova um, and eventually he's expelled from court um, because he doesn't walk it finely enough. Hmm. Um, so th there, there is sort of, you know, you, you come as close as you can to the beloved, but you can't actually consummate that kind of relationship. There's always distance. And then of course, um, later on, in the way that Parajanov kind of lays out his life, um, that distance is amplified, and that's when you get these echoes sonically from earlier in the movie, more fully realized um, in the context of the poem, um, sort of as a whole. Um, of course, um, it's a present absence um, at the same time, because if we think of in the Criterion Collection release, the final image is the one that I ended my slideshow with, um, where it's the beloved. Um, now sort of transformed into this ghostly, otherworldly, sublime being um, that I can't help but read as art itself. This is the poet's art that's now, that's the real thing he was striving for in a way, even though it's also bounded to the human, earthly, beloved, um, and um, to love in a, in a sense too. 
So the film, you know, makes that absence present through the, um, the citation of poetry and through its thematics, but also, of course, the absence is, is always there, it's always present in the fact that the film is art and it's in your, if you're watching it um, and you're hearing it and experiencing it too. So you're sort of part of this dialectic of, of presence and absence um, that Sayatnova's verse is based on. If you want to go a little further, you could sort of say like, okay, like the image themselves rely heavily on absent spaces. Um, you know, that it's modeled on Persian miniature painting. Um, mm. And so it's this, this famous tableau, the very flat dead style. And sound also does something similar. There's a lot of silence. And so when sounds do come in, um, they're shocking or they're other, they're sort of, um, they're heightened in a way um, that beg us to engage with them. Um, in, in a way we're kind of not used to or, or able to do always. Great. Well, I think those are, that's our questions. Uh, so this is really, really fascinating. I think there's a lot here. I mean, it, it, it illuminates many aspects of Armenian literature, but uh, more broadly, many aspects of, of the Caucasus, uh, the cosmopolitanism underlying the literatures of the Caucasus. So that's exciting from a Georgian or Persian perspective as well. So um, yeah, I guess, I guess we can call it an end here or uh, yeah. Uh, before we end, if I could just mm -hmm. say that uh, I hope you'll all join us on November 4th at 5 p.m., I believe, Eastern Time. Uh, Lori Khachaturian from Cornell University is going to be presenting for us uh, Life Extempore, Trials of Ruination in Armenia's Soviet Factories. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. Um, and if I may uh, thank thank all of you, particularly uh, you, uh, Dr. Gould, for agreeing to- It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you. To be our discussant. Uh, thank you to the Center for Armenian Studies for all your support. Uh, Naira Tumanyan, thank you for uh, for organizing this and, and, and taking such a strong lead in this. Um, Alex McFarland, thank you very much for being so uh, being so energetic and taking such a big role in this conference. And uh, Michael Pfeiffer, specific thanks to you. Without your help, this project would never have gotten off the ground to begin with. Um, looking forward to working with you all in the future. And uh, if you'll join us, I hope you'll all join us for the after webinar Zoom hallway discussion, which is going to be taking place right after this. It's just the panelists, but, um, but right. everyone else will be there in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you everyone so much for coming. Um, I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Goodbye.